the Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. What is your definition of home and does forgiveness always mean a second chance? Chia McNani explains in episode two. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences, and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. And today we've got a very special guest with us. We have Chiomi Nani, who writes multicultural fiction for women um, aged 18 and above. She aspires to be a strong, independent and fulfilled. So Chiomi is the author of Forever, uh, Forever There For You um, and Because Home Is, as well as she's co-authored Seamless Five by a full box set. So I can't wait to find out more about these amazing books. So she is an LLB graduate of the University of Kent in Canterbury. And she is also a postgraduate certificate of food laws. I'm looking forward to finding out about that from uh, the university there in the UK. So now she's, she is the UK BEFFTA, which is Black Entertainment, Film, Fashion, Television and Art awards winner wow that's a mouthful um for the blog of the year and the ceo of fearless storyteller house emporium uh, limited and i love it and then you live now where do you live jeremy where do you live i live in abuja in abuja and where is abuja it's in nigeria it's the capital of nigeria oh my gosh i hope the weather's fabulous there i can hear a little bit of rain but at least it's, it's not- raining <laughs> Excellent. Have you lived there all your life? No, I haven't. I lived in, well, I was born in Port Harcourt, went to nursery and primary school in Port Harcourt, which is actually where I met my husband, but long story. And uh, then for secondary school, I moved to Calabar, which is where my husband comes from. Long story. And then for uni, a uh, college and uni, uh, college, I was in the city of Oxford. And then uni, undergrad, I went to Kent in Canterbury in the UK. Uh, postgrad, I did that with a, a university in Leicester, also in the UK. Uh, lived in the UK for a while, returned to Abuja, um, went to London, moved, uh, sorry, to Lagos. And then, yeah, just moved about quite a bit. <laughs> wow, so it sounds very nomadic. It sounds really exciting. So when you were young, what were you aspiring to be? What what was the thing that you wanted to do when you were young? Um, when I was much younger, this is gonna sound not so, but when I was much younger, I wanted to be invisible because I did not have a very happy, I didn't grow up in a very happy environment. So there's that thing of, oh, well, you know, they're doing this to me because they can see me. So if nobody can see me, I mean, you can only attack what you can see, right? So if I'm invisible, maybe I will be safer, but yeah. So you've grown up in an environment of family violence. Yes. Yes. And did the patterns... Absolutely. And it wasn't... Sorry? So did the patterns persist once you left the home? Once you left your home? Um, No, because I was very intentional about ensuring that those patterns stopped and that they stopped me and that meant that I, I just, I, for me, if I think something wrong, find out why it happened and 
then sometimes that means I can prevent it from happening again, or at, I mean, I can't change the past, right? But I can prevent it from happening to me or to my child. And that's just a thing of, I can, I can basically say, you know, that was me of then, and you could do that to me then. This me now, nobody's going to treat me like this again. So even if it is something that I am doing, I mean, I don't think that any abuse victim deserves it, but if there is something I am doing to even attract the abuser, right, whether it's I'm putting out vibes that make me seem needy or whatever, then I work on that and just cut, cut that off because... And this is, you know, this is something that is probably going to sound trite, but I say this all the time. An abuser abuses because they want to and because they know they will get away with it. It doesn't, it, you know, it's not because they were uh, hungry or horny or angry or, you know, because you upset them. Because you'll find out that for many abusers, whatever it is that they claim you did to trigger them, other people have done that, or even worse, right? So a man, his boss might, or even including his female boss in the office might yell at him or say something he doesn't like in a way he doesn't like it, but he doesn't touch her or, or him, right? Or whatever, but somebody, a police officer or a, a military guy on the road can do something to that abuser and the abuser is going to be very calm and do so. Right. So what that means is that they can actually control themselves. They're just choosing not to control themselves with you because they know that they're going to get away with it. And in the culture that I live in, in Nigeria, that's that's like the norm. Right. If you if you, if you're abused, especially if you're a woman in a in a marriage, well, in a marriage, sometimes in a relationship, but in a marriage, it is seen that you did something to bring it on yourself. And the man is never wrong. At like the abuser, the male abuser is never wrong. You're the one who did something wrong. You're the one who needs to fix it. And you need to fix it with prayer and with fasting and with being more docile and submissive. So how did you break yeah. the cycle? How did you break the cycle from being in a family environment where you've got family violence and that's all that you can mm. see and then now living in an environment with your partner where where that's all that you can see. So how did you then break the cycle? Um the funny thing is so when I was growing up all I heard was and this is like at least I'm not exaggerating at least three times a day I heard how I was stupid and I was fat. I've never been overweight in my life. I, I, I heard how I was stupid and fat and useless and would never make anything of my life and that I was last. This was my parents that said this continuously over and over again. And the weird thing was, I don't know how, I knew that I knew some or something deep down in me knew that they were wrong, right? I, and I didn't have any proof of them because I mean, if someone is, everyone around is telling you this one thing, but deep down you're thinking and feeling something else, you kind of feel crazy because where, you know, what is your proof? But I remember that when I was, um, I, I don't know, I, I was there at 20 or 21, I went to this church and um, during the, the sermon, the pastor said, you can be anything that you want to be. You're not useless. He, like, he didn't know me. I don't even think he knew I was there, but it was just something that he said from the pulpit. He said, no matter what anyone has said to you, it doesn't have to define you. The, you know, he gave some examples, including of people in the Bible that had been written off. And um, shortly after that, I traveled to the UK and I saw all the things that I thought were possible that I had known were possible, but I didn't have any proof of. So being in the UK was, oh wow, I'm not crazy. Um, these things that I think, this safety, this respect, this, you know, all that, these things really exist. 
And so for me, it was not, going to the UK wasn't just about um, getting a degree, it was about renewing my mind and seeing real proof that some things were possible. I remember in my first year at uni, I did this thing we call a mini pupillage, which is where you um, you sign up with a chambers, a, a law chambers, and you you're like an intern, kind of. And the one that I did the the mini pupillage with was in a small um, chambers in the in the town where I went to uni, and it was a family law. I did it in family law because at the time I thought I wanted to become a family law barrister. And I saw this couple that had been divorced since 1983, and this was 2006, and they were still sniping at each other, still, still being horrible to each other. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like they've put three children together, they've been divorced since 1983, and they're still angry and bitter. So what, I mean... You know, I, I didn't I didn't see any proof that it had been violence, but I could see that the man had moved on in a sense that he had a new partner, but he wasn't married. And the woman, she was just, she was very twisted and angry and bitter. And I remember thinking, oh no, I can't, you know, no matter what happens, that can, I can't let that be me. No matter what anybody has done in my past, I'm gonna try to work on myself. So it's not just, you know, a lot of times people go, Oh, I want to find the right partner. I want to be, I want to find the right partner. But are you what that person that you think is the right partner? Are you what they would recognize as the right partner for them? Because just as an abuser recognized you as, as this is somebody I can abuse and get away with it. There's some, there was something there that made them think that. So are you what the person that you think is going to be the right partner for you? You, if you're still in that state where somebody thinks they can abuse you and get away with it, then you're probably not what the right partner to you would look like and think, ah, yeah, I can be with this person. And so for me, I used that time to try. I mean, I didn't get it right the first time. I <laughs> made some mistakes, but... <laughs> but I use that time to work on myself and get to know myself because, you know, sometimes people, and this is, um, I, I don't know how it is in Australia, but when I was growing up, I read um, these romance books, uh, Mills and Boons, and they would all talk about how the right guy was tall, dark, and handsome. And the funny thing is, I'm not really attracted to tall, I mean, I like tall, but not dark. Right. And so because you've seen all these things that have told you what the right guy should look like, so you can stumble on what you really feel and what you really want. And then you're going after because I actually um, had uh, some relationships with guys who were tall and dark and they didn't work out. They treated me really badly. And it wasn't a point. I was like, hang on a second. You don't even like these guys like that. You, I mean, you like something about them, but this is not, this is not your type. Why don't you sit down, look at yourself, look at what it is that you really like, you know? And this is not just the physical thing. Like, think about the character and the personality of this person. Because I was listening to, um, I was listening to another part podcast and this guy um G G gosh I don't know the name Jivan Mataru he talked about how you know you go oh I don't want the wrong partner but you're not actually saying I don't I want the right partner and you're not even defining what that right partner is for you right you can go tall dark and handsome but so what things change people he can have an accident right and he's not going to be facially handsome anymore. Even if nothing happens like that, he can age, right? Things can happen. So what are you gonna do? Well, you can be with this tall, dark and handsome guy that treats you like crap, which is what ha happened to me at some point. And so I had a lot of self-work to do a lot because I realized I was carrying a lot of horrible expectations like, you know, because, and this is something that I tell a lot of people, a, a girl's father is the first, um, 
the first expectation of a man that she sort of has a right to have. And if he tells her that she's everything, calls her all the horrible names in the book and some books that she hasn't read, then, you know, there's a way that she sees herself and then she's probably going to jump into the first relationship with a guy who says, hey, you're pretty. And she's going to do all kinds of things to hold on to that guy who really, if she works on herself, she wouldn't go, no, I'm way out of this one's lead. And that's what I had to do a lot of it. And yeah. Mm, so you've gone and you've now written two books from your experiences and you've also co-authored a third. Can you tell us... Yes. Um, for the people that are listening today, the whole process of diving in deep to your story and to your learnings, and do you find that a cathartic thing? Do you find that a releasing thing? Do you find it a, like a therapeutic thing? Would you recommend that this is what people do when they're trying to move away from those limiting beliefs and those thought processes and family patterns? Um, so... Some people, when they are going through something or they've gone through something, some people eat, some people shop. I write to process and I, I journal a lot. And Forever There For You was a, it was cathartic because I had to go to places that, like, and I'm talking mentally, that I didn't necessarily want to go again. And, um, and again, obviously the research for it, that wasn't my experience. And it was, it was difficult to write, but it was, it was something that I knew that I had to do. And I remember that when I first started uh, researching and I had done the first draft and my publisher had it and he said, this is amazing, but I think, you know, let's preview this and see what people think first before we go into editing and put this out. And one of the most, as far as I'm concerned, the most ridiculous previews we got, we had of it was that it was an unrealistic book because in the book, the main character, the protagonist, she, 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 she doesn't have the same background that I do. She has quite the opposite. So she's got very loving father, but things happen and she finds herself in this abusive marriage in the UK. And then when she tries to tell her dad, her mom intercepts her uh, because her dad has had a stroke and her mom says, oh, you're going to kill your dad if he finds out about this, like it's going to be heartbroken. So you need to stay in that marriage and you need to work on yourself. And so the previewer said, oh, that's silly. No woman is going to send her daughter back into an abusive marriage to die. This does not make any sense. And it got to me because I was like, who, do you, who are you to be saying such a thing, right? I live in Nigeria. I know this happens. This is, how dare you? And the my publisher at the time said, look, just don't bother about her. She's clearly not the audience for this book. Think about the fact that this is a, I think she was from Poland or something, and she was in her 50s. So now she will be like in her 60s or 70s now. And she has lived in the UK for, you know, and she, basically she's walked in certain circles where this thing that you've written, is news to her. She doesn't know anything about this. So just ignore her. Write what you know is true, what you have seen, and remember why you started writing this book. So it was very, um, it was cathartic, but I didn't want it to be like an autobiography. I did everything to make sure that it was not like an autobiography. I mean, obviously she shared, the, the protagonist um, of Forever There For You shared some of the same characteristics as me. Like I remember that when I first got into the UK, my hair started breaking. It was very, it was very traumatic. Um, but uh, I remember that one of the other criticisms that we got was, um, oh, a woman who has a good dad, can't end up in a relationship with a bad man. I'm like, what, what is wrong with you people? Like how, so there was that thing of no, people who, are, who have abusive parents always end up in abusive relationships in the adulthood. And I was like, no, that, that doesn't seem right. No, that doesn't sound, no, no. And that for me was at that point, on some level, I guess, I was looking for hope. Because you see, if you, um, if you grew up in a terrible environment, you need hope that 
that will not always be your story, right? At that point, I hadn't, uh, I met my husband at a time, but we weren't dating or anything. Like I said, we met when we were in nursery school. We met in kindergarten at the age of two, which is funny. But at, on some level, I was like, if I were ever to have children, I need to have hope that what happened to me, what was done to me will never be done to my daughter. And I know that in some regards, like it's too late for me. I can't have a different father, you know, but I can have a different husband and I can have, I, I mean, different in terms of different from my father. And I can start something. There's something that we say in my language, in my dialect, which is also a mena, which is, it means, this will never happen again. May this never happen again. So it's the breaking of the curse. And so I, I that kind of person who, I, I was like, if I ever have a daughter, I need her normal to be different. If, and so let this be the starting of something new for my descendants. You know, that, that you didn't have something doesn't mean that it's not possible. And it doesn't mean that people, the ones coming after you shouldn't have it and so for me it was very much a thing of whatever this is it stops with me and yeah it, it was cathartic and um I felt like it had to be done and I, I I knew that I would receive blowback from people in church which I did because um the abuse in uh, forever there for you it, it was done to a it was done by a man who um was very religious to his and was done to his wife and it didn't and, and she went to the church for help and they treated her very badly so for a lot of people in the nigerian church system and african churches who read it, it was like oh how dare you call us out i'm like because this is what you guys do and you cover up abuse and I think one of the things that, it, that really meant a lot to me was women who are much older than me reaching out to me. There was this one I will never forget. She reached out to me and she said, this story you've written could have happened to me. She said, I've been in an abusive marriage for 18 years. I've been in limbo. And because of this book you've written, I just gone and filed for divorce. Thank you for giving me my freedom. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I had the book, uh, Nigeria has this, um, this really popular domestic violence charity called Project Alert. And I had a copy of the book sent to the, um, I guess the executive director at the time. And she was like, how old are you? When she read it and I told her, she was like, have you ever been married before? I said, no. And she's like, I. So how do you even know these things? Like, you know, she said, look, I worked in this charity, I've done this for years. These words you have written, these are the exact same things that women that come to me every day. This is the exact thing they're saying, the excuses they're giving, the justifications, everything. How do you know? I'm like, yeah, I, I haven't gone through that in, in my personal life on that level where, a guy that I'm dating would hit me or would speak to me a certain way, but yeah. So that was cathartic. Because home is, <laughs> is was actually a bit of a different story. Um, when I was much younger, I read this novel and in the novel, there was a character who said, everybody is either running away from something or towards something. And I believed that for a very long time until I was like, hang on, when you get home, you don't run anymore, right? And so what is home? And that's the essence of the book because home is, it's about people finding home, what home means to them. And what I say is home is a person, a place or a thing where you can be naked and unashamed. You don't have to run anymore, you're home. Right. If you feel safe, if you feel loved, even when you do things that aren't right and but nobody's killing you for that and making you feel lower than low, then you're home. And for some people, that is a person that they feel that way. And for some people, that is actually a job 
where they make a difference that's more than to their bank account. And what is really, really strange is when I got the idea for Because Home Is, because that's a short story collection, a part of me was like, nah. But then I thought, no, I want to write this book and prove that I can do it to myself. Because at that point, I had sort of thought, oh, you just write long feature story, like, you know, feature like novels, like, because I was working on a second novel that wasn't really working that well. And I thought I had writer's block. And so I was like, no, wait, let me, this Because Home is the stories in Because Home is clearly wants to be told. Let me go with that. And what is really funny is one of the stories in Because Home is, is actually a story of my husband and I. That's not the funny part. The funny part is I wrote the things in that story, then they played out in real life for my husband and I. So I wrote them and then they happened in real life. So some people who know us, they think it was the other way around. I was consciously writing about my husband and I, I wasn't. It just, I don't know what, I don't know what happened. It was prophetic, it was, some people say psychic, I don't think so, it just happened. And again, like I said, you know, all the stories in Because Home Is, there, there's a guy who is, um, he suffers from situational depression can't tell the woman he's in love with because you know I'm a man I can't feel these things and she's got all her stuff going on there and she's gonna see me as damaged which is something that happens in Abuja quite a lot women in 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 the public eye in the media are seen as unattainable and to a Nigerian man who uh, a lot of Nigerian men they think when they have money that's enough but when you meet a woman who has her own money you're kind of like, oh, well, okay, what am I bringing to the table? And oh, I have depression as well. She's not going to want me. So they that, that story is about them finding their way home. Uh, because, you know, you see somebody, you don't know what they're dealing with. She's also, he doesn't know, she's got health problems of her own, right, that are not written on her face. So there's that. Uh, there's another story about a, an immigrant to Nigeria from Kenya who uh, she comes in on a, oh, I'm going to make a difference and I want to do this job. And have, so she works as a columnist for a newspaper and <laughs> falls into hot water straight up because people are like, we don't, you know, how dare you come in and say these things. And so she has to resign. And this is a job that she thought, oh, you know, this was her dream job. Her mentor got her that job. And then she leaves Kenya, comes to Nigeria, where she doesn't know anybody but her mentor. And the day before she lands in Nigeria, her mentor dies of breast cancer. So it's like, oh, I, I, I don't, I, I think I've made a mistake, but there's no going back now. And somehow she starts a, this is before I knew anything about podcasts like that. And so she starts an online radio station, uh, an online radio show out of her tiny flat and somewhere that's on the outskirts of Abuja because she can no longer afford to be in the center of Abuja. And it just blows up. It takes off in a way that she, she couldn't have imagined possible. And even her former boss is like, you know, you know, I had to do what I had to do because of the political situation, blah, 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 but I'm still going to help you. And it's that thing of literally take just pull one step in front of the other. You don't know who is silently rooting for you. And that's something that I had to come to terms with because I'm very open in terms of if I think this is this, I'm going to say this, if I think this is that, that's good. But I had to learn that sometimes someone is rooting for you. They might not be able to do that very openly as you would like, but they're going to pull strings behind the scenes to make sure that you get what you need. So there's all these different stories of people trying to figure out themselves and their lives and what home is for them. So that's um, the story of Forever There For You and Because Home Is. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, you know, most of our listeners are coming from a space of healing through love, either going through domestic violence or they're out the other side. And, uh, and, and obviously this is where you've come from, from family violence, and then reached out and uh, written these books as, as, as you've said, part of your healing, part cathartic as well. 
Um, you mentioned before, and in closing, because we're almost finished, but you mentioned before in and around the church, has the church been helpful fundamentally for you to move forward? Or did you actually find that was a challenge? It was a challenge. And I actually had to leave the church because I felt, you know, I, I didn't feel accepted. I did not feel, and it wasn't like I was trying to make trouble. It's like, no, look, these are real issues. So you would rather, I said nothing and, and women said nothing and, you know, in order to maintain some, some kind of status quo. And I'm like, no, I'm choosing me. And it's really funny. This is something that I say, like, we should all be pick me's. And I know that in today's culture, that, that phrase, pick me, it does not mean a nice thing. But for me, it's a thing of, I pick me. I'm picking me about, you know, tradition and culture and what people are going to say, because at the end of the day, like, you know, if anything happens to me, these people are going to move on. Uh, I think it was a couple of months ago now, um, a very popular gospel singer in Abuja died. Long story short, we found out after she died, of course, that um, her husband, who is a pastor, had been beating her. And the beatings, like, I mean, no beating makes sense, but this way particularly vile. Like, he would stomp on her chest. Are you kidding me? Like, I mean, a, a punch is bad enough, but you're stomping on someone's chest. What exactly is the motive, you know? And um, they've got four children together. So now, of course, this woman, you know, she refused to leave the situation. She said she was praying for him and, and all that. And the thing is that some people said, look, the truth is, you know, you could, you could tell her, oh, she should have left, which I think she should have. And some of the people who are saying she should have left, they would have stigmatized her if she had left. But at the end of the day, you know what? She's now dead. Her children are basically orphans because in Nigeria, we have the death penalty. It's a life for a life. We're not playing, right? So she's dead. Her husband, if he's found guilty, and he probably will be, he will be executed. So what's going to happen to her children? You know, some women say, and I, I get to tell her, oh, I'm staying for my children, but you're raising them in this horrible environment where they are, so, if they're not, uh, sort of despising you for your weakness. They're feeling um, obligated to protect you. And that shouldn't happen. They had a child, you're the parent, right? You, you shouldn't, I mean, they shouldn't parentify you and have this burden of, oh, you know, all men are like this. So this is what I should be like as a man and abuse women. So for me, that um, the, my experience with the church hasn't been a mostly positive one and for me it's like no no I choose me no self-respecting God is going to punish me for choosing me I'm sure that he does not feel honored when somebody is dishonoring me or any of his daughters really so yeah mm, so well if people want to listen today and they want to actually reach out to you how do they get hold of you how do they connect with you Okay, um, this is <laughs> going to be a long URL, but... Oh, no, that's um, okay. We'll pop, the, we'll pop yeah. the URL into the show notes, so that's okay. So they can contact you via okay. the URL. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, we can. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time with us today. I really appreciate Likewise. it. Likewise. What time of the day is it for you? It's, uh, it was 10 o'clock when we started, so I'd say maybe about 11-ish now. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's 7 o'clock at night for us. <laughs> yeah, I know. You guys are like, um, <laughs> you guys are like, your, your hours are, I, I was like, wow, you guys are like in a whole different new day. <laughs> I know, and it's okay, and that's what we're all living on around planet. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today, and we Likewise. look forward to contacting you soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast.